problems in the psychedelic uh, world is that, um, that the science part and the journals and the uh, conferences and that side of it is the teeniest, teeniest sliver of what's going on. And there's not too many areas of science in which that's true. Um, because the federal government about 40 years ago um, decided that there was no, um, no acceptable, no conceivable medical use and a strong possibility of abuse. The problem that I see is not that there is uh, misuse, but there's an awful lot of trivial use. You know, there's a, the notion is that, you know, if something, say, is a microscope, if you, you know, pick up a small microscope, it's got a handle, you know, it's kind of set so you can easily carry it, and it makes a great doorstop. But it's got other uses. And when I see a microscope being used as a doorstop, that makes me a little sad. I had uh, written a chapter for a, a, a book on the 60s. Uh, it's amazing, suddenly I find out there are history courses called the 60s. And if, you know, if you want to feel like you're a fossil, woo! <laughs> and some wonderful people were putting together a reader. And they had these great stories. And so I did a, a, a piece for it. And uh, I have a very, uh, there's a very fine writer in my family named Ann Fadiman who has a wonderful, wonderful book, among others, called When the Spirit Catches You, You Fall Down. And so I sent her that little thing from a book, and she wrote back, um, there's a book in there. And I thought, oh yes, <laughs> a book about me. <laughs> what could be more incredibly, intrinsically interesting? <laughs> and so I actually spent a whole summer studying me, <laughs> Getting out old notes and old journals and reading books from my era, kind of memoir. And then I had this epiphany which said, who cares? And the, the circle of interest, as I figured out, was probably smaller than my Christmas card list. <laughs> <laughs> but I live in a world where when things happen, you assume that maybe there's some larger picture and you're just a part of it. So I thought, here I've spent this whole summer, I've got all these notes, I have all these timelines, I now read all these books. And I thought, well, is there something I know that other people don't? And it turned out that I was in the peculiar position, for a lot of reasons, of having been involved with most of the major areas of psychedelic research. And I was aware that the, the way to use these materials well was starting to vanish. These substances seem to have existed before humanity existed. And it's a very peculiar question, is why is it that there is an alkaloid in a mushroom which seems to actually does, it fits a receptor on your brain cells. It's a key and lock, okay? Now, it existed before we did. Why is that? That is a very interesting notion because it turns around a lot of what um, you've been told about um, evolution. And one of the things that seems to happen when people use psychedelics, even in a somewhat um, trivial kind of concert going way, that they tend to be one more aware and feel better about other people and more aware of the natural world. And that in itself is worth noticing. Um, because certainly, whatever else we say about what's going on in the world, um, as a species, we have tended to lose contact with the natural world. Read scientific literature, it, it always reads like they knew what they were doing because it's always done after they're done. But in reality, science is a, um, it's driven by ignorance. In that you only tend to do research, unless you have a lot of, unless you really are just doing it for the money and the grants, you tend to do research on things that you don't know about. You want to find out something. Um, I actually don't do research, I do search. 
my curiosity has always been what, what's going on, and particularly what's going on with these extraordinary substances that clearly were designed in one way or another for human consumption. And one of the things we know is that as far back as we know history, that cultures that have had these substances available have used them. Um, almost always in a spiritual sense, almost always um, limited in, in most cultures to the kind of spiritual class or those people. <coughs> um, and they've all seemed to think it was important. We have, in the West, created a whole new class of use, which you find almost nowhere in, in any other culture called recreational use. We found a way to not get much out of these experiences. Fortunately, I didn't deal with that much. What I did deal with was what I call entheogenic use. And uh, the word entheogen means God manifesting or God infused or something like that. The word psychedelic means mind manifesting. And a particular use of psychedelics is in this entheogenic or spiritual use. And what I mean by spiritual is to have, to use these in a way to have an experience of your actual, your actual state of being, who you actually are. And that quite apart from your social conditioning and your language and your culture and whatever good or bad things your parents did to you and whatever cultural differences there are, but there is something um, more profound than that that people who discover it all agree have made the same discovery. It's a little bit like coming to the top of a mountain. There's, there's really thousands of ways to climb any given mountain. But the view from the top is relatively similar. And so people from the top say, oh yes, this is similar, and the way I got up the mountain is probably better than the way you got up. But at the top, we can stop that kind of silliness. And I worked with a group in Menlo Park called the International Foundation for Advanced Study, if as. This was in the 60s. And they had permission from the federal government to, to work with these materials as a therapy, as a psychotherapy. And what they found was that the most effective kind of psychotherapy was to give people this view from the top of the mountain where they did not have any <clears throat> issues about their own um, mental condition one way or another. And then as they came down, they were dealing with their psychological issues from the position of knowing that it was only a small part of their whole being. And it's fairly straightforward, um, and it is about safety, and it's about security, and it's about trust, and it's about feeling that you are in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing, and that other people have done this. Um, any of you ever had an operation? Okay. At some point, someone says, just relax, and they... <laughs> And at the next moment, you can feel your consciousness saying, wait, 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 I was not. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and then, you know, depending on the operation, you say, have you started yet? And they say, we're finished. <laughs> so you had to have a certain level of trust, right? Someone runs up to you on the street with a little thing with chloroform, you say, no, thank you. But if you're paying like, a, you know, at Stanford, $1,000 an hour, you think, okay. <laughs> well, psychedelics for an entheogenic, experience you need to have the same level of trust because you are really saying to someone, I trust that you know what you're doing and that if there are complications that you know how to handle it. And so there are a couple of chapters in here which go into that in considerable detail, both how to be a voyager and how to be a guide. 